I'm Sean Carroll. I'm a theoretical physicist at Caltech. And have you ever seen a UFO? I never have, no. I have, have thought I have, and then people said, oh, that's uh, you know, an airplane or a firework or whatever. Okay, have you ever been abducted by aliens? No, I've not. Have you ever had, you must have talked to people who have seen UFOs and been abducted. What do you, Yeah. and what I, do you do? How do you deal with that? Well, you know, I uh, try to explain to them the scientific method. I try to explain that there's more than one possibility. I, you know, I had a, uh, a guy that my mom used to date was a pilot, an amateur pilot, and he was convinced that he and his friends, the pilots, had seen UFOs. So I just tried to convince him there could be alternate explanations. <laughs> okay, good. And uh, are we alone? I don't know. I'm actually you know, one of the few people I know who doesn't know, who like, doesn't think that it's obvious that we either are alone or are not. I think that the data are very, very far from being decisive here. What do you think the question means? Well, the, I take the question to mean, are there other intelligent life forms, let's say, within our observable universe? Uh, we don't know whether we're the only life forms here on Earth in our observable universe, much less whether any of them are intelligent, but that's what I, I would take it that we're not alone if there are other intelligent beings out there right now. Okay, so strip off the intelligence and then ask the question, are we alone? I still don't know. Uh, I have no idea how easy or hard it is to form life. It could be very easy and there could be hundreds of millions of life-bearing planets in our galaxy, or it could be extraordinarily hard and we could be the only one in the observable universe. Okay, and now you have written a book called The Big Picture. That's right. So what is a big picture and why is it important? The big picture to me is how the deep down laws of physics that make the universe go connect with this manifest image, the daily image that we see of our lives. We human beings are made of the same elementary particles that we discover in particle accelerators. How does that all fit together? And why is that important? Well, I think it gives us both a sense of what we can do and can't do as human beings, uh, a little bit of a the sense of the scope of our powers and the reason why we're here, namely that we are a very physical, natural phenomenon that arose according to the evolution of the universe. Well, some people like you and I, we care about that, but a lot of people don't care about the big picture. They haven't read my book yet. I'm hopeful <laughs> that it will be in all the hotel rooms right next to the Gideon Bible, and then they'll change their mind. Right next to the Gideon Bible. So you mentioned Gideon Bible. So... Often science is accused of finding out all kinds of facts, but they're not that meaningful. They don't give people meaning. Uh, do you address that in the book? Absolutely. I think that uh, meaning is very important, and I think that I don't know the once and for all final answer as to how people should find meaning in their lives, but I think that knowing what we are and how the universe works is an important starting point for answering that kind of question. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, how about matter? Let's talk about that you're made out of matter. You're surrounded by matter. So how did matter come into existence in our universe? I think the word is baryogenesis. When did That's that right. happen? How did it happen? Why is there this asymmetry between matter and antimatter? Well, it's an amazing fact to start, to start off that there is matter and antimatter. There are these two opposite sides of the coin, and it seems that in our universe there's a lot more matter than antimatter, and again, nobody knows. This is a, an area where we have many different models, many different theories that, that seem to work pretty well, but they're very different. They're, processes in the very early universe, the first tiny fraction of a second. Well, how much of a fraction? Not the first second. Well, we don't know. Oh. Again, we don't know. Well, not I, last year. I say, no, the first second is the, as early as we have data at all, right? We know what the universe was doing one second after the Big Bang. So anything mysterious like creating a balance between matter and antimatter happened, happened before then. Before one second. Before one second. Between zero and one second, in other words. Between, so between the Big the Bang and time, one second afterward, yeah. Between the Planck time and one second, that's the range at which, that's like 43 orders of magnitude in, in which baryogenesis could have occurred and we don't yep. know where? That is correct, yes. Wow, that's pretty bad. What do you say about this in the big picture? <laughs> I don't say anything about matter versus antimatter in the big picture. I mean, it's not supposed to explain all of the laws of physics, right? It's mm. supposed to say how we human beings fit into them. So I take for granted there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. I, I thought the best candidates were like at the gut scale or that, uh, I don't know, electroweak scale would be the best candidates for when this occurred. Is but there's not... a big difference between what the best candidates are and what is right. And so <laughs> we keep adding more candidates. So yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, as far as we know, the universe was very, very conventional and normal one second after the Big Bang. And after that, before that rather, we have a bunch of ideas. Okay, how about the laws of the universe? Some people, as physicists, we often say, oh, if these are the laws, we have to just uh, take them for granted. But some people, some scientists, like Paul Davies and maybe John Wheeler would say, where did the laws come from? Mm -hmm. Did they evolve? Were they existent somehow before, in some platonic world before the Big Bang? Or what's your take on that? 
Well, I think that we're allowed to ask that question, but we're not allowed to insist on an answer. You know, we can say, is there some deeper explanation for why these laws versus some other laws? But we have to be open to the possibility. The answer is, that's just how they are. And so I'm very open to that possibility. All right. Well, how about the, when you say just how they are, for example, the same question can be asked about the universe. Is it exactly. unique or right. do we live in a multiverse? What's your take on the multiverse? I think the multiverse is quite plausible. I think there's very natural, reasonable looking theories of uh, how the universe came to be that produce more than one observable universe locally. And so that's possible. It's also possible that our universe is more or less all there is. Um, that's another one where I'm going to say we don't have the answers yet. I, I thought when I get asked that question, I say, well, if we're going to combine general relativity with quantum mechanics, Quantum mechanics is something that doesn't deal with unique events, it deals with statistics and probability. Therefore, it's highly suggestive that when we do combine quantum mechanics with general relativity, we will have a bunch of statistical, uh, I guess, suggestions about other universes. Is, would you agree with that? Or? Well, I think that's fair, but you have to distinguish between two different ways. There's probably more than two, but there's at least two popular ways to use the idea of a multiverse. One is that literally there are places far away mm -hmm. where conditions are very different, where mm -hmm. the local laws of physics, the masses of the particles, and so forth are very different. And that, I think, we can take or leave. I think we just don't know what to say. Then there's also the quantum mechanical idea that when you observe a quantum phenomenon and see one of various possible outcomes, the universe splits into all the different possibilities, the so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah, but I those think, possibilities have the same value of g, the same value of c? That's or? right. They would have the same laws of physics. They would be almost identical, except for this one little experimental outcome was right. different. Right. And I think that multiverse is actually very reasonable. I would put more than 90% chance that that is correct. I think that we actually know a lot more about the fundamentals of quantum mechanics than we do about the early universe cosmology. I see. So what about this idea of, of having it in a multiverse where you could vary these constants by a little bit and based on this little bit called the universe that we live in, fine-tuned? Yeah, I think it's, again, something that is open. We, it, we certainly observe the conditions around us to have very, very specific values of the parameters of physics and cosmology. Some of those parameters seem unnatural to us. They seem like not what you would get if you randomly picked them out of a hat. So maybe... That's because we didn't randomly pick them out of a hat. There's a multiverse, and we only observe those parts of the multiverse that we can live in. But is there any suggestion from quantum mechanics or quantum cosmology that there is a distribution of such values, of C, of G, of the mass ratio of protons to electrons? I, I thought that that was not necessarily a suggestion of quantum mechanics. It's not necessary. It is a possible outcome that can come out of some more speculative ideas like string theory and inflation. So again, that's something I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's very easy to imagine that it is. Okay, now if I gave you a billion dollars to look, to try to answer the question, are we alone, what would you do with it? Well, that's a good question. Probably, you know, I would spend a lot of money trying to understand how life originated here on Earth. We don't know a lot about that. I don't think we know a definition of life that everyone agrees with. I don't think that listening to radio signals from elsewhere in our galaxy is a very uh, cost-effective way of looking for intelligent life elsewhere. I think we've got to take the long view. Let's understand what life is. Let's send probes. Let's build rocket ships that can get there. It could take tens of thousands of years, but that's what's going to matter. Recently, I asked an Indian student the same question. He said, oh, we should invest that billion dollars in trying to stay alive. So mm -hmm. he wanted to, because it's easier to find extraterrestrials if you stay alive than if you die. If you kill Not yourself. at all unreasonable. I think that, <laughs> okay. you know, we, we worry a lot. We say stars are light years away. It will take hundreds or thousands of years to get there at any reasonable rate of speed. So I think that your student is right. You know, if you live for thousands of years, it doesn't seem so bad. Okay, so let me ask you again, how does knowing the big picture help us figure out who we are and whether we are alone or not? Well, I think that it depends on, you know, there's many different possibilities for the questions about why are we here? What is the ultimate nature of reality? If we think that the universe we see, the physical universe, is not all there is, if there's more to it than physics and stuff, then we can imagine that the physics and stuff was put here for some purpose, you know, that it, that it fulfills some teleology. But if you think there's nothing but physics, if, you, if you're a physicalist, if you think that the world is just the stuff obeying the laws of physics, then purpose doesn't come from outside because there is no outside. It's up to us to create any notion of purpose. But physics is the, th let's say the ultimate physics we are looking for is the theory of everything, and that doesn't include biology or natural selection. And well, we are, it doesn't include life, for example. So the theory of everything does not include life, so it doesn't mean life that there's Life is made out of things that obey the theory of everything. I mean, yes. life is made out of particles, right? Yes, but there's no way to get from some eventual theory of everything to a human being or a, or a wart, a liverwort. 
Well, I think that there is in principle, in practice it's very hard. You know, we're, you don't do biology by thinking about particle physics, but biological organisms are collections of particles. And I think that knowing that says that, for example, you cannot bend a spoon with your mind, right? Knowing the laws of physics tells you that even before you do any experiments to see whether or not people can actually do that. So that kind of reasoning can tell us a lot about our place in the universe. Okay, so with this billion dollars, let's say that we had some weird ideas. For example, we could go looking for nano aliens, for example, talk to some mm -hmm. microscopists who could look in very, very tiny, tiny, tiny aliens. Uh, or maybe, kind of like a neuron in your head, it's part of, we're part of a larger thing that we don't know we're a part of. That happens, for example, when we're, we have this controversy about whether Gaia, or a, the biosphere, is alive or not. Or maybe we're even part of a larger entity. I think in the Men in Black movie, they had you know, the galaxy on the inside right. of the cat's uh, medallion or something. So the question is, do you think either of those scenarios is something worth looking for? Nano aliens versus we are part of something so big that we don't even know about it? Uh, how would you investigate that? How would a neuron investigate the idea that they're part of a larger brain that thinks in different ways? Well, I think that the very example shows us how far away we are from being able to answer these questions. I mean, that's like saying to Galileo, how would you go about measuring other galaxies or the expansion of the universe? He didn't have the technology to do that. Mm. That's why I think that if I really cared about whether or not we're alone in the universe, I would do some of the basic research on how life can come into existence. Mm. I don't know whether it's something like nano aliens or Gaia are even at all reasonable because we don't understand these complex systems well enough yet. Okay, so often I've heard the term, the story of the scientific story of Genesis. And in some sense, that's what the big picture I imagine your book to be about. So could you summarize the scientific version of Genesis in a few minutes? Well, you know, what again, you understand about how we are here, the Big Bang and the origin of everything. That's right. We talk about the Big Bang. So 14 billion years ago, the universe was in a hot, dense, rapidly expanding state. We know this because we look at the universe now and we can extrapolate backwards. It's expanding now. It used to be smaller and smoother. We sometimes slip up and we say that the Big Bang was the beginning, was that there's nothing before the Big Bang. The truth is the Big Bang is simply the end of our theoretical comprehension of the universe. It may have been the first moment in time, there may be nothing before the Big Bang, but it may be there was something before the Big Bang. It may be that quantum mechanically there is stuff, there is universe on the other side. So I think that this is again an area where we should be very, very humble about what we know and what we don't. But that's, I asked you about the scientific genesis story. You got us from the Big Bang to just after the Big Bang. That's right. <laughs> that's now, now for the 14 billion years. Good. Well, so that we understand quite well. I mean, there's an amazing amount that we know what happened one second after the Big Bang and later. You know, the Big Bang was very, very hot. So individual atoms and nuclei and even protons and neutrons that are made of quarks and gluons, they just couldn't stick together. It was so hot, they were smashing into each other. But as the universe expands, it also cools off. And so particles in larger and larger conglomerations can come together. So first, the quarks and the gluons came together to make protons and neutrons. Then the protons and neutrons came together to make the nuclei of light elements like helium and lithium and deuterium. Then a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, atoms could form. The electrons could join up to these nuclei and make atoms. And then after that, the universe is transparent, light can go through it, we can see the leftover radiation from that era, that's the cosmic microwave background, and gradually, 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 gravity pulls things together to make galaxies, stars, and planets. Well, so far, if we replay, if we went back in a time machine to 14 billion years ago and did let the universe run again, presumably the things you just described would happen again. More or less, yes, that's right. But when biologists do the same experiment, and they go back to the Cambrian explosion 540 million years ago, then all hell breaks loose. They can't agree on whether it would or would not reproduce the same, similar or the same or identical or completely different uh, organisms that are alive today. That's right. And, you know, we, we don't know. It might be quite similar or, or it could be very different. But that's because the biological organisms we're talking about, these are very highly complex interconnected systems. Something like a planet or a galaxy, you know, as marvelous as they are, they're pretty simple. There's a bunch of stuff that came together under the force of gravity. Biological <laughs> organisms that are f tuned through Darwinian evolution to fit into some ecological niche, tiny variations in how that process worked out could leave us with something very, very different. Well, one of the things we want to know w whether it would reproduce itself or would re be uh, evolve again would be human-like intelligence mm -hmm. or any given particular species. Now, 
when I've thought about this problem, I, I, stumped, I talked to Lawrence Krauss about this, and I said, hey, Lawrence, is, is it true that, all th that the probability of anything happening is zero? And he said, yes, everything is impossible. So the idea was, that the idea was, let's suppose you have an electron between zero and one meter. And the point is that when you measure it, you have a delta x delta p greater than h bar, but that, that is more of an epistemological delta x that has to do with you probing it to find out where it is. But the, I thought that, uh, my understanding is that in Hilbert space where we do all these calculations, this, we deal with real numbers. Therefore, that electron may realistically have a position of 0.66354, et cetera, onto infinity, it might have an exact position. If that's the case, then that electron has a probability of zero being in that position. And if that, then, then if that's, if one electron is a probability of zero, then all of the electrons have a probability of zero being wherever they are. And so, et cetera. So that means, so that's the logic behind everything that exists is a probability of zero. Yeah, I don't agree with any of that. I okay, hate to so, say. So, so, so what, part of it, it depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. You know, what do you think quantum mechanics is really telling you? To me, quantum mechanics is not epistemological at all. It is a straightforwardly realistic account of the world. Maybe I should have replaced it with empirical instead well, okay, of ontological. But what matters is whether or not you think that there is something called the position of the electron. Yes, yes. Quantum mechanics says no. There just isn't anything called the position of the electron. There is where you will see it when you look. How about the height, but the, when the you're, middle, the peak of the wave function? The wave function is the state of the electron. Yes. Whether it's peaked somewhere or not peaked anywhere else, but that's all there is. There are more and less likely places to see it when you observe it. That's yes, what the yes. wave function tells you. Yes. But when you're not observing it, it is a wave function. It doesn't have a position. It's a wave function that doesn't, I thought I could, as a wave function, has a position where it's peaking, right? There is a position where it's peaking. And but it's an exact position. Sure, but who cares? The wave function, the whole wave function, is the state of the electron. Okay. All right. Um, now, let me ask you again. Are we alone? I don't know. And why don't you know? Well, because we don't know enough about what it takes to make life or intelligence in the universe. Okay. Is this question important? Yeah, I think it's very important. I think Why? it's crucially super duper important. Why do you think that? For one thing, it would be a lot of fun to talk to somebody else who is other than us. You know, we're extraordinarily young, right, in the history of the universe or even the solar system uh, as intelligent beings. The human race is, has a lifespan measured in hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, technology and the scientific method are enormously younger than that. So if we did find another intelligent civilization, they would almost certainly be way more advanced than us. That could be good news or bad news for us. Who knows? But it's just intellectual curiosity would make it very, very interesting to talk to them and see where they've gone. Now, I've been asking questions, and presumably you've been using the rational part of your brain to answer. Now I want to talk to the emotional part of your brain. So if you could close your eyes, and I'll ask you, what kind of aliens would you really like to find with mm, emotionally? I don't yeah, that's a, that's a good question. What would I like to find, I think, is um, I'd be very happy just to find aliens that in any sense we could empathize with. You know, aliens that were not so alien that they were just inexplicable and impossible to understand because they will be very, very different. If there's some fragment of something we might mislabel as humanity in those aliens, that would make me very excited. Well, wouldn't you, I would have thought that you would also want them to be able to empathize with you. So yeah, that, I think so that's very likely, you, if, you know, <laughs> not being kill killed. Us. But, I, you know, I think that, again, it's almost impossible for us to imagine what it will be like to even be human a million years from now, right? We've been doing science for a couple thousand years at best, right, maybe a couple hundred years. To do it for another million years, we're not going to be recognizable as human beings. Right? So, and that's humans, much less aliens, who have just come from a completely different starting point. So to make any extrapolation into they'll want to eat us, they'll want to enslave us, they'll want to take our natural gas or whatever, I think that none of this is anything we have any right to have an opinion about. How about something as weird as, you know, we discovered you know, gravitational waves detected directly just a few weeks ago. Um, do you think that the should the electromagnetic search for aliens move over to gravitational wave search for aliens? No, I think we should lo be looking for artifacts. That's really the only way to look because the problem with both electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves is they go right through you. You know, they, they travel at the speed of light and they don't stop traveling. If I were, you know, if we last for a couple more thousand years and our human technology gets better, if we want to send out signals to other potential life forms in the rest of the galaxy, you don't do it by beaming radio waves or gravitational waves. You do it by sending rocket ships. 
and landing in a solar system somewhere else and staying there and waiting for life to appear because then you're integrating over billions of years rather than some fraction of a second or a year as a signal passes by. So what is your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? I don't know that one either. There's a very, very obvious solution, which is that life is rare. I think there's no evidence against that. All we have is the fact that we exist. Life is rare. Maybe life is rare. I don't know. I mean, maybe all life is very rare. Maybe intelligent life is rare. Maybe technological life. I think the easiest one is that life is rare. I don't know if that's true. There's sort of more subtle answers, like once life becomes very intelligent and very advanced, they all upload themselves into computers and they become bored. And they stop exploring the universe. These are all very hard to imagine because any of these crazy scenarios require that it happens every single time intelligent life appears. Whereas life itself just being rare, that's a single easy answer. Now you've written a paper about the, I guess the Boltzmann problem, the Boltzmann right. brain problem. Boltzmann brains. Yes. And so you know, if we're if we are a member of this uh, group of ensemble of observers, then we should be Boltzmann brains because we have an infinite future and uh, vacuum fluctuations can fluctuate into existence. Right. Observers. Now I read the, I just skimmed that paper briefly, but I thought somewhere in there you were talking about the probability of set of measure zero of. Boltzmann brains becoming observers. Did it wouldn't I be a set of measure zero, it would be a small number. A small but number. I, I think that one of the things we realized recently is that it's by far not clear that in empty space Boltzmann brains even can fluctuate into existence. And again, it depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. If you take quantum mechanics literally as a realist theory and think of the wave function, the quantum state as describing the world, in the future that state stops evolving. It asymptotes to a vacuum state and stays there forever. So nothing fluctuates into existence, brains or anything else. Well, I thought vacuum state had vacuum fluctuations in it. No, that's just a bad way of talking about fluctuations. The word fluctuation means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. The kinds of things that exist in the quantum vacuum are not time dependent fluctuations. They're just a difference between the classical state of the theory and the quantum state of the theory. But the quantum state still just becomes perfectly static and nothing happens. Uh huh. So, so straighten me out on this point. Now, you said it might be that Boltzmann brains do not ev come into existence. Come into existence. Yes, that's right. So, with they might have a probability of zero. Then that's right. It is possible. So how? So I'm trying to the the idea of something that could happen having a probability of zero. Is that the, the I mean? Well, if it has a probability of zero, then it wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen. Yeah. Uh -huh. If it has a probability of small but not zero, then it would happen. It's so been an infinite number of years. <laughs> so you think that's the the Boltzmann brain problem then is a misunderstanding of what a Boltzmann brain is or what an observer is? Yeah, I think it's, it's well, we don't know yet. There's different scenarios. So again, we're trying to be open-minded, but it is possible that the quantum state has the property that if you were to look at it, there's a non-zero probability you would see a Boltzmann brain. Just like when the electron has a wave function, there's a non-zero probability you see it here or here or here. But when you're not looking at it, and the wave function of the electron is just some static, unmoving thing, it's not maybe it's here, maybe it's there, maybe it's there. This is it. That's mm -hmm. the wave function. And you say the same thing about the Boltzmann brains. There's nothing fluctuating, popping into existence. It's just sitting there. But isn't there a difference between an electron that has a wave function with a peak here and a wave electron with a wave function with a peak an infinitesimal difference away? There's a difference, but again, that's a completely irrelevant difference to this question, which is, does the wave function change over time? If the wave function is static, if it is not changing, then there's nothing fluctuating inside that wave function. Right, but can I, ha okay, <laughs> all right. All right, how about some jokes? Do you have any astrobiology jokes or uh, are we alone jokes or alien jokes? Astrobiology jokes, um, boy, you should have warned me about this. No, <laughs> off the top of my head, I am bereft of astrobiology jokes. All right, how about uh, if we're, we're running a, a talk called uh, if they are aliens, will we, we recognize them? And they, do you think that we will recognize them if we uh, do? I think we'll know that they're aliens. I don't think they'll look anything like us. Okay. 